So uh, please uh, be with me because this is my first presentation ever. So uh, no pressure here. <laughs> so, what I'm going to talk about today is now before we had the presentation about the future, especially in the closure community. And what I'm going to talk about is how not to go backwards, <laughs> maybe. And I hope it would be uh, good. So uh, this is me. I'm Romanian. I live in Spain. And I love closure. And ha I have been doing uh, closure in production and closure script in production for about maybe six years. OK, so the goal of this presentation is, or this is a promise that I will let you decide whether pipelines or pipes are better than other ways of, of writing code. And in order to do that, I will actually implement six solutions to a problem that I'll present uh, fairly soon. And then we'll look at readability. And we will change the requirements to, to look at how we can extend the code. And then we will look at some debugging options, you will see. And finally, I will let you decide. Well, it doesn't mean that you couldn't decide without me letting you solve. OK, so this is the problem. We will write an endpoint, which is just a get, and has to return an offer by its ID. Fairly simple. You can do it in any language. And it will give you the right offer if you find it uh, 200 and the, the offer data. And if it doesn't find it, or if, if the ID is wrong, uh, you'll get a 400. And a 404 if the ID cannot be found. So it should be fairly simple. Yeah, I added that if the ID is valid but not found, some deposit should be notified that. And the very first solution I said, OK, this will be imperative ifs. And the schema is kind of like that. If you have a valid ID, yes, then go find it from some database or something repository. And if it's found, then return a 200. If it's not, notify the deposit, return a 404, then transform everything to JSON. This wasn't really necessary, but I needed more steps. So uh, <laughs> that's kind of how we will do it. So yes, I will cheat here. Notify is, as you can see, and, and empty function. It doesn't do anything. And then transformation to, to JSON is, is this. And then the repository itself is just an atom. And then the code, as you can, oh, scrolling is interesting. And then the code is kind of like this. And when you look at it, I hope it looks bad. <laughs> so I try to make it look as bad as I can. And then this is actually an interactive, very hard to scroll. And then, as you can see, if I do this here, everything is interactive, and it works. So why should we care? But there are other options in solving the same problem. So for instance, in Java, and the Java community tends to focus on throwing exceptions. Something has happened. We throw an exception. It gets caught somewhere upper level in the server. And then the server will transform that error into some message. And I said, OK, let me try that. So I kind of cut the code. This is interesting, OK. And I made it. <laughs> kind of like that. Basically, everything happens in a try catch. Depending on the type of exception, I will return it. Now, in the Java community, this is very popular. And I don't think it's bad, but, well, as you can see, the code is not, the, not very nice to read. Then, and this is actually uh, JavaScript, the, the Java community, but I wanted to do it in JavaScript here because it's actually, uh, I can run it, which is, uh, and you kind of choose a strategy of what you can return. And I don't want to talk about that pattern. It works in this case. 
but it can break fairly easy. So, in functional programming, we have this concept of pipes. Not only in functional programming, but uh, functional programmers want, want to get some data and then pipe it through something and then get a, a final value at the end. And that sounds really nice, but this is actually the happy path. And what, um, and then I said, look, a pipe makes sure that steps get executed in a cer certain order. And the result of a step is actually passed to the next one. Now, in the, in the closure community, everybody does that every day. And this is how they look, not something very complicated. In our case, for instance, it would be validate, find offer, JSONify. But this is, as I said, the happy path. What happens when we have errors? And this is where things start to be a little bit more complicated. Not really, but we will see. So, I made this solution number four, which is actually based on how F Sharp or Haskell or Scala or Java or would do it. And it's uh, the either monad, but I don't want to talk about monads. Forget about that. That's too complicated. Basically, we will have at each step some function that will get some response and will either return an error or a success. It doesn't sound very complicated, and in fact, it isn't. And I had to implement it in, in JavaScript just to, to make it work. But basically, I said, OK, this is the I response, and then I, I will have probably a class which will be successful, right? And one which will be error. And then the functions, which will do. This will be the pipe. And I specifically used for the happy path, then, instead of map. You would see that, for instance, in, in Scala or in, in some languages. And then I specifically said fail, because everybody has been using that for a long time. It's called promises, and it's in JavaScript. And then, as you can see, the code works. <laughs> and you can get the presentation and actually test how it works and then transform it to Java, even though I think the, the railway-oriented uh, programming talk about F Sharp will explain everything better, is uh, Stephen Lachin, I think, his name. OK. So that's how you do it with classes. But we don't like classes in this community. We like pure functions and data, and we are a data-driven community. And uh, so let's look at, look at what we can do in terms of um, how we can uh, solve the problem in, in a closureistic way. So one way of doing it would be to actually have some, some sort of flag. So you have a function. When the data enters, you say, is my flag on? Yes, skip it. So basically, that's how it will happen. If you have an error, it will basically skip all the other functions down the pipe. And in my case, I just said, if I already have a response, then just return that. And kind of like that. Now I tried all these drawings or things are made by, my, made by, by me, and you can show, you can see. <laughs> so my pipe right here would be this one, right? I would start with some uh, request and then validate, then find, then make the JSON. So let's look at these functions. So as you can see, for instance, when I enter the second function, I have the very first thing, it would be a word. Do I have a response? Yes, re return the state. If I don't have a, a response, then actually compute it and do some things. But this is a lot of manual intervention. Now, depending on how you write the pipes, because you can write them with com uh, composition, your own composition, not comp, you can actually put that in, and that will automate, automate a lot of the things. 
Okay, so this is the sixth solution, and it's it's like all. It has some upsides and it has some downsides. And for instance, the value, if everything goes okay, we'll go through all the steps. But I said we will have an additional overflow pipeline. So basically, if things break, they will move through, through the other pipeline. This is how traffic, for instance, a bridge closes, police will stay there, put you on another. Uh, so this is kind of the the way, but how do we implement it? And actually, I will use in this case exceptions. Now that's the downside of it. But it means that my code looks kind of like this, right? And that safe is just a way of encapsulating. You can, you can do it, encapsulating what happens and uh, getting a try catch and getting the error out. But as you can see, the functions are fairly, fairly simple. And whenever, they, they, uh, whenever you need to get out of the pipe, you would throw. Now, that's a little bit uh, a violation of purity. But this is the compromise I chose in this case. So in terms of read readability, pipes kind of get you this kind of things, like step one, then step two, then step three. And if it crashes, you will have an, an on error, or something will catch those errors and transform those. And depending on how good you are at uh, naming things, you can look at the pipe with your PO, who knows nothing about programming. She would still understand the flow uh, in the code. So that's the part about readability. But that's, let's look about extensibility, at extensibility. So now we have new requirements. Basically, we will have something that the, uh, our offers are now active or not. And we will get kind of the same errors. And then if we happen to need to return an offer that expired, we will have a new error. And then the ID and then I said, OK, for expired orders, you have to return uh, an error. And for analytics, now we need to actually compute every time something uh, gets, gets called. So that just to complicate things a little bit. And uh, well, in the if solutions, so we will go through all of them. In the if solutions, I had to complicate a little bit the repository. As you can see, now I have one that's expired, this one. And then I have a, a function which increases the number of requests as you ask for them. And as you can see, the, the code just became uh, way more complicated. And you have seen our requests. They're not that, they're not that uh, big. But as you can see, the code is fairly um, complicated. So this is an image from GitLab. What did we change? Well, a lot. So we added a lot more ifs inside our previous ifs, increasing, increasing the cyclo cyclomatic <laughs> complexity. And this is also a problem uh, because we had to change code that worked heavily. So that's why I said maybe the title of my talk should be how not to go back and change what was working. OK, so for solution two, I don't show the code directly. I will show you directly the uh, changes. And, and in gray is like the new code. But as you can see, it's actually inserted over the old code. So it's kind of a mixed bag of things. And it's kind of ugly. And we, added, we had to add the new exception, obviously offer expired exception, and then we change the code inside the try catch, and then we say uh, we had to change how we capture everything, and mm, not really nice. I skipped solution number three, and I went uh, straight for solution number four, which is for typed languages, and I said, let's look at that. And as you can see, we added two new functions, and that's a good type of change. You add things 
we did have to change something in the existing code, but it's still a little bit better, I would say, than what we did before. And we're improving here, I think. This is the repository for solution number five, which is the flag. And as you can see, we have two new functions. So the insertion points of our new code is here. And yes, these are the, but we always have to put this. In every function we write, we have to put this. So I don't like that. And this is the comparison. And as you can see, we have two functions which, which are completely new, but we also had to touch something that was working before, which I don't like. So it's better, but it's not good enough. This is solution number six, the overflow. As you can look, we added two new functions, which are completely independent from everything we did before. Everything we did before still works. And we just had to insert them into the pipeline. So no existing code was actually modified except the insertion point, which is the pipeline. And this is the, these are the kind of changes that I like because uh, many times you have to roll back and relying only on Git, good luck with that if you have, I don't know, 80 developers or 300. Or... Okay, so this is the final solution uh, that I came up with. Ah, I wish I could just scroll. Maybe I'll do it like that. As you can see, not too much, and even these functions are fairly small. Okay, part three, debugging. Now I think, especially in our community, some people will feel, just like I do sometimes, that using a debugger could be a smell, something you didn't do right. That's why you need a debugger. However, sometimes you don't have a debugger, so what do you do then? You log things and you trace things, and for instance, in, in our first solution with the ifs, remember the code was fairly complex? You have to now add a lot of things like trace. Now, this is a naive in implementation. You'll probably use some logger, or if it's a Java solution, I don't know, like log4j or what's the, the biggest and best now. But you will have to inject a lot of logging everywhere. What if you get it wrong? What if you didn't inject it in the right place? And uh, it's ugly. I skip the next two solutions because they will do exactly the same thing as first. And went straight for solution number four, which is the first pipe. And I said, you just introduce some tracing into the pipe. You don't change anything in the code before. And as you can see, all the green stuff is basically what they introduced. And this could be quite naive because sometimes you will know the, the error will happen about here. So you have solutions. This is how the, the, the log looks like. And if you look, for instance, at this. Now, this is actually an image, so I wanted to. <laughs> uh, you will kind of see in the log how things happen, in which order. And it's a fairly good, fairly good way of doing it. And if I, were, if I had to write Java code, this is how I would, would probably write it. And in fact, this is how I did. Now for solution number six, because solution number five and solution number six are, f uh, six are fairly similar, I, I just added the same thing. So traces in the, in the uh, pipe. And this is the final result. So for instance, for 200, this is what I get. So I validate and whatever data enter that function and then, and then I get even, uh, in some cases, I even get the whole repository. How was it at this time? How? So logging, as you could see, can be done without changing the code, just injecting it in the pipe. And it could, you can get rid of it, put it in whenever you want. And this is how, for instance, look at this, 400. Validate, 
directly to response. So it means it didn't execute the extra steps. So that's why I like it. And uh, in terms of logging, it's, it's, I would say it's fairly good. Okay, so what else? So now we got to the resuming part. Maybe I got uh, here too fast. <laughs> Uh, so I said that our goal is for you to look at what I did and decide whether uh, pipes are bet a better way of handling code. And I guess we got, we got there. And uh, we implemented six different solutions. And I said, let's look at readability. And uh, you can make up your mind. And then how do we handle extensibility? Like, uh, what does it mean when we have to have a, a change? Is it always a breaking change in the code? Do I have to change my code that was previously running or do I just add to it and insert the new code? And then we looked at some fairly uh, naive debugging options, but uh, they could be extremely powerful. So now we got to the point where you can decide which solutions do you want to use? Now, you may ask, why am I presenting this to the Java, uh, to the Java, to the Clojure community? Because we, we have the macro threads and everybody uses them. And my answer for that would be, I looked at a lot of implementations, whether it's open source or whether, and we're not doing it right. That's why I wanted to say, maybe I should show it again so people can, can, so I wanted to add some examples and some of them are very old, for instance, and I wanted to, to show that this can be done in a variety of languages and runtimes and it doesn't really matter. These are promises, as you can uh, see. And then, for instance, some very, <coughs> very simple front end for, um, for a closure script thing. Uh, would kind of do that, save and get the value of my model and now change it. And then uh, I, can, I even have a post uh, condition in here. This is actually the code that one of my colleagues from a company I w used to work for called Codurance wrote. And this is his actual code, the, the, the library response, as you can figure out. He was looking for, for uh, books, not for offers, like ours, but the model is fairly similar. And instead of using then, he used map and flat map. Maybe flat map can be avoided. And then this is a, a, a Python backend. And as you can see, because we don't have the, the um, uh, operator, I decided to compose all the functions and then run it like that. And even then, we use then and if it fails, it will be caught in, in some thing. And for instance, this is Elixir, it uses a, it a lot. F-sharp, um, Scala, whatever you use. And because ma many times I talk to people and they think functional programming is MapReduce and immutability. And it's not. MapReduce is just one way of writing pipes. <laughs> When you need to map something, filter something, you will create a pipe and then use those specific functions. Okay, so. I would like to add a few more things to what uh, you already saw. I said, in terms of testability, this is really, uh, really good because you can test all the functions separately. And if you like pure functions, then you can test them in isolation and depending on how you want to uh, test the pipe, you can do that as well. Also, they are async uh, agnostic. If my pipe runs in a Go block or not, it doesn't care. Same for JavaScript. If it's an async await or an actual promise, uh, it, can, it can go like. Then, for instance, we could do things that are atomic. And basically by atomic I mean either everything happens or nothing happens. Like database transactions, which everybody likes uh, because. And for instance, 
If you're careful, you could actually do it. So the writing side, sorry, I put a timer here. <laughs> uh, if you're writing right at the end of the pipe uh, and something breaks in the pipe, it will skip the writing, like skipping everything else. So you will, because of immutability, you will still have the previous value, which means nothing has happened. And in my case, over here, I said, OK, I want to do an atomic operation. I want to put it in a try catch. And the commit, which actually changes my data store, is at the end. And uh, ooh, I wish I could scroll. OK. So that would be the normal way. I just reset my data model to some previous value, which is basically idle. And these operations, as you could see, just move the idle to start it working done. So that would be the three steps in my pipe. And normally, that's what it does. Right? I start from idle, I do the atomic operation, then I look at my data model, and it's done. What happens if something fails? Now I did a redefs, and I said operation two will fail because it will throw the ice cream has melted. And as you can see at the end, we'll go back to idle. So either everything happens or nothing happens, which is such a, a big step in terms of writing systems. OK, uh, that was another example of using pipelines. And then I said, and this is something that we actually did in the past, automation. What if you do the pipes generic enough and you'll be able to, to reuse them? And I don't know if you actually see very well on this because well, I drew this myself. So I said, what if you have several uh, GraphQL? For one thing, you have to, to load users and for those users, the jobs and for those jobs, the companies, and whatever. Or you can load groups and uh, from groups their members. Or roles, but they only have ID and name. All of them can use exactly the same pipe, right? You, you can have a load pipe, and it can say, OK, validate the query that you're sending me, like the GraphQL query or whatever. Then generate one for my datomic or for my MySQL or for something, and then run it, and then collect the results, and then later transform it to. So you can actually use the same resolver beh behind the scene, which means you have to write less code, which is something that I like a lot. But people say, what when, when I have an exceptional case? Well, there's an answer for that, and it's fairly simple. <laughs> So for instance, right now, I want my role to also do an extra step. What do I do? I create a new pipe, and I reuse everything that I had before, right? It's the same thing. And then at the right time in the pipe, as you can see, I will insert, do an extra step, whatever that means, notify something. And that still allows you to extend when you do automate automation to extend in the right way, to customize whenever you have to, to customize things, to customize it the right way and simply. OK. <laughs> I, this is my last slide. Uh, and uh, before I, 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 I say goodbye, and I hope you understood what I tried to say here, uh, maybe some questions. Yeah, thank you, Dan, for your talk. And I think we have time for one or two questions. Um, anyone? Yes. Hey, thanks for that. Um, I, I really uh, do like how, um, how your last solution looked. Uh, what I wanted to ask is, have you done any performance comparisons uh, between, the, be, between the different models? Because, you know, I, I was taught uh, traditionally that exceptions should be reserved for exceptional cases and 
if I go back, go back to your example, uh, getting an invalid ID or not finding something is kind of kind of feels like a valid yes, yes, valid yes. business case in this. So that's why I wanted to present more solutions. And solution number five and solution number six uh, are exactly for that. In fact, you can always combine them because uh, you can write some pipes in some way. And if you care a lot about performance and you, you see, obviously, uh, especially in the JVM, but in most things, uh, exceptions would, would slow you down. And if that matters, because sometimes it doesn't in JavaScript, if you click something and it's three milliseconds or four, it's the same thing. Um, then you can move to the other one. And yes, you can improve on that. And yes, my solution was biased <laughs> towards uh, solution number six. But yes, solution number five can be done very well, but you will probably have to rewrite the way uh, you compose the functions. So instead of writing yourself, if something happened, you will do that in the composition. Well, I hope I... Cool. Uh, one more question. Hi, so uh, do you have any recommendation for retrying patterns? Something went wrong in the pipe and I want to retry from this entire pipeline again. Like, do you have any ideas or solutions? Because it's, it's a personal problem that I face as well. Well, I do. I haven't given it um, a lot of thought. But right on from the top of my mind, I think there are, there are solutions. If, if a, pipe, a pipe in the end will be inside the function. And then you, you can decide inside that function whether it can be retried. And maybe you use a library like that one, uh, which is made by um, Netflix, Hytrix, Hy uh, Hystrix. And, or you can implement something on, a, on your own. And in fact, I think there are some, some closure solutions uh, quite good. So I hope that helps. <laughs> Great. Then give another hand of applause to Dan, and we're going to be back in five minutes.